l'Assemblée. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Sayyid Ebrahim Raisi, President of the Islamic Republic of Iran. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Mr. Sayyid Ebrahim Raisi, President of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Blessings and greetings be upon you in the name of God, the Creator, the Omnipotent, the Most Gracious, and the Most Merciful. May the blessings of the Almighty shine upon the Prophet Muhammad and his descendants and successors. The Holy Quran states, Dear Creator, Omnipotent of the world, accept our regards and respects towards your chosen messengers, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad, who brought the message of justice, spirituality, and proper behavior and compassionate comportment to the people of the world. And they destroyed the foundations of uh, injustice and lack of fairness to allow humans to build a new world for their future. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Secretary General, the foundational need for a better world is justice. All of the hopes and aspirations of humankind are built on justice. And they have the capacity for the creation of such a framework of all-encompassing justice, which means elimination of injustice. We are defenders of a fight against injustice in all of its forms, against humanity, against spirituality, against the Almighty, against the people of the world, no matter where it may occur. A wish to be closer to the Creator and the teachings of the Creator exists in all humanity, and their willingness for change is witnessed in revolutions throughout the history of humanity, even though a lot of movements never reach the maturity of a revolution, many of the revolutions deviated from their pa original path. However, the success of many people and nations, such as the nation of Iran, in the realization of their aspiration for the Islamic revolution has strengthened in the heart of the people around the globe such aspirations. Uh, the Islamic Revolution of Iran was the realization of the movement of the people of Iran towards justice and fairness, even though faced with a lot of plots throughout the decades, it has been able to safeguard itself. As a first step, the nation of Iran, based on an advanced social and organizational order, created the Islamic Republic of Iran in order to create justice internally and bring to the world order a message of justice and fairness. Key components on this path were spirituality, multilateralism. Ladies and gentlemen, I am grateful and honored to be the representative of a people and a nation that has inherited a great civilization that has been free for millennia and has always managed to defeat the plots of the enemies that sought to conquer it, a nation that has always seen oppression as an existential enemy and has always fought in order to destroy the enslavement of Babylonians all the way to the Palestinians. We believe in a common fate for humanity, and we are for 
the globalization of justice, what we seek for ourselves, we wish on to others as well. And what we do not wish for ourselves, we do not impose on others. The nation of Iran believes that justice brings unity, brings cohesion, and warfare is a destroyer of all things. For a country that wishes internally to have justice, but then outside of its own borders creates or trains various terrorist groups and unleashes them on various nations, must be ashamed in the face of humanity, must be ashamed when faced with principles of freedom and justice and fairness. Humanity does not only belong to certain segments of the world. The Islamic Republic of Iran, by taking aspiration from its constitution and the values, the spiritual values upon which it is based, sees as one of the most effective ways to safeguard human rights and has used the most useful tools in order to realize and assist in the realization of the rights of all of the oppressed across the globe, sees that as one of its inherent duties. The Islamic Republic of Iran rejects some of the double standards of some governments vis-a-vis -vis human rights and sees that as the most important factor which has rendered banal the topic of human rights in the eyes of many because this is something that is currently taking place, a discourse that is taking place in the Islamic Republic of Iran where we started speaking of and creating a dialogue about the death of tens of innocent women in a Western country. So until we have these double standards where attention is solely focused on one side and not all equally, we will not have true justice and fairness, human rights belongs to all, but unfortunately this trampled upon by many governments. Uh, the native tribes of Canada whose bodies, bodies of hundreds of their children were discovered in mass graves in a school, the rights of the Palestinians, the right to life of the occupied, uh, of an occupied people, of those who have fallen victim to terrorism, those who seek freedom and refuge, but only to have their children locked up in cages. All of this shows that the place of the accused and the defender must not be judged solely as it is represented by some. It does need a foundation which many lack these days in order to claim the right to safeguard human rights. When talking about and remembering the savagery and the crimes of ISIS, of Daesh, that enslaved Christian and Yazidi and other religious minorities, women and children, it shows when we entered the arena to defeat them, it shows that we have been clearly on the side and as defenders of human rights and those who defended and promoted Daesh, ISIS, had to be seated at the table of the accused. Uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen gathered here today, we see today that we are witnessing a change of the world order, a unilateral world, a world of hegemony, a world in which, in which finance, financial power gains control over standards of behavior, where criminal and oppressive sanctions against nations and the use of international organizations as a tool of oppression and exerting pressure on defenseless nations. In other words, we're speaking of a world completely privy of justice and fairness. So this order has lost its support in the thought of nations and people throughout the globe. A new order has been has been shaping up to take its place and it's undoubted it's without a doubt that it will be created from Lebanon to the Palestine occupied territories all and all over our region we see the defeated policies of such an old 
system. Now we see terrorism. We see the trampling upon of native cultures and religions and standing unjustly against multilateralism, unilateral actions. All of these have created great challenges on the path to human progress. We firmly believe that in order to face the challenges, old challenges as well as new frameworks in the world, we have no choice but cohesiveness and unity based on multilateralism and justice, based on shared human and common values, based on divine teachings. There is no other path. We believe that all freedom-seeking nations have their hearts tied to such deep-rooted values and the defense of all of these values against the oppressors across the globe rests on our shoulders. What we seek is the right of the Iranian nation, of the Iranian people. A relationship based on oppression will not be tolerated. We will stand firm and proudly defend the rights of our people and our nation. We believe that any oppressive action is an action against world peace and stability, which is a threat to the entire world. Reaching security throughout the world through any path other than justice would not be sustainable or permanent, and that is precisely what we expect of the United Nations to support and do. Of course, the implementation of justice and fairness is quite challenging and difficult, and perhaps it is because of that that many of those who claim to be on the side of peace, they run away from the responsibility of peace. So we say on to them, since you do not wish to carry the burden on your shoulder, do you not even wish to carry the burden of fighting against oppression? Our f belief is deeply rooted in the Quranic culture that says do not be oppressors nor oppress anyone. And the fate of many nations is tied to exactly these principles. Those who run away from the logic of character, fairness and justice run to unilateralism and oppressive powers. A nation that lacks logic relies on coup d'etats, military interventionism, boots on the ground, a chosen uh, and unfair selective fight against terrorism, and many other injustices. The use of nuclear weapons, did that take the world closer to fairness, justice, and peace, or did it become the foundation for hegemonic powers, the killing of hundreds of thousands of Yemeni, Iraqi, Syrian, and Afghan children. Which human value did that serve? Were these not the evil faces of the total lack of justice and fairness in many parts of the world? And in reality, what does what does the Islamic Republic of Iran seek other than obtaining its own logical and fair right, which has caused havoc and chaos among the oppressors of the world? Dear colleagues, uh, today the willingness to move in support of hegemony has become a sore point for humanity throughout the world, and it is a serious threat. It is the wish of the nations across the world on an increasing basis to obtain justice, independence, while enjoying security at the same time. The realization of the front of resistance shows, I repeat it, the realization of the doctrine of resistance shows the extreme and deep-rooted willingness of many people to obtain true justice, whereas unilateralism has been the tool that has, used, that has been used to hold many countries back. 
on a selective basis. America cannot accept that certain countries have the right to stand on their own two feet, and they keep equivocating militarism with security. The Friends of America do not enjoy a better situation. What is occurring today in Europe is a mirror image of what has occurred in Western, uh, in Western Asia in the past few decades. The, co the comportment and the result of the movement of the troops throughout these regions all have yielded the same results because all of them have shown that the fate of many countries shows that America has pursued her own interest at the expense of the interest of many other countries. Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, the Islamic Revolution in Iran was the beginning of a movement of a great nation of Iran to seek her own place in the world. And through the decades, we have been faced with foreign plots such as coup d'etats, oppressive sanctions, as well as hegemonic interventions, but none of the successes of the Iranian nation have been acceptable to the great powers. From the time that the first president of the Islamic Revolution of Iran, the late Mr. Rajai, showed the sole of his feet that had been tortured savagely and placed his foot upon this podium for some 40 years ago and showed the scars of the torture that he was subjected to uh, at the hands of the Shah's secret police. After that speech in this very hall, he was martyred by the hypocrites. About a decade after, the late Imam Khomeini made it so that the nation of Iran could was able to repel foreign aggression from her territory and be in charge of her own destiny. The people of Iran who have themselves been victims of terrorism have today become a supporter that can be counted on in the fight against terrorism throughout the region. Today, the Islamic Republic of Iran, in order to reach her just aspirations, has spent much capital. From the time when Saddam Hussein tore up the Algiers uh, Accord and attacked Iran in an unprovoked manner, all the way to the time when the American government trampled upon the nuclear accord. And we saw a new face of criminal behavior against humanity. Some time ago, the previous president of the United States of America announced that ISIS was created by the United States of America. For us, it makes no difference whether ISIS, Daesh, was made by which administration, a rich American government. What matters is that a government on the other side of this planet decided to bring havoc and chaos to the geography of our region at the expense of the lives and the blood of women and children and the innocents. But the Islamic Republic resistance put an end to that movement, to that destructive movement. And the leader that descended into the arena of the fight against terrorism was no one other than the beloved late martyr General Qasem Soleimani. A man, a freedom-seeking man who became a martyr on the path of obtaining the freedom of the nations of the region. And the previous president of the United States of America effectively managed to sign the document of the savage crime, an illegal crime, an immoral crime. And what was said in so many words shows that the oppression that is imposed upon the nations of the region in such a fashion, it has managed to heal some of the broken hearts that we saw in result of this crime. The proper pursuit of justice 
in the face of a crime that the American president admitted to have put his signature on will not be abandoned. We seek through a fair tribunal. We will pursue through a fair tribunal to bring to justice those who martyred our beloved General Qasem Soleimani. Ladies and gentlemen, the history of Iran is the history of a nation that has learned to stand on her own two feet and not to lean on anyone else, to depend on anyone else. Iran learned this lesson after, in both world wars, it announced its neutrality, yet was always subject in both wars to foreign occupation. And after, in the 1950s, when it came towards America and relied on America in order to obtain the national dream of the nationalization of the oil industry, it was again betrayed. And after the nuclear accord was signed and accepted within the framework of the United Nations Security Council, even that accord was trampled upon unilaterally. Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, the nation of Iran has learned the policy of resistance and progress, which has been focused on pursuing because of an advanced and logical social order in which the Islamic Republic of Iran today, despite the oppressive sanction, has become a strong country with many impressive goals in the fields of technology and knowledge and expertise that have been obtained. We do believe that the world today needs a strong Iran. Today, while having the capabilities to export, and in, in addition to our exports of oil and gas, we do have distribution networks for electricity throughout our vast nation. In knowledge, knowledge seeking, uh, Biosciences, nanotechnology, nuclear sciences, we are at the forefront. Uh, and Iran's growth in these sectors is considerable. And it shows our social efforts where in many instances, for example, when we have tried to bring universal health care coverage to 85 million people. And the pursuit of the will of the people is a foundation of the system of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Whereas during the times of the imposed war by Iraq against Iran, we were even prevented from being able to purchase barbed wire. But today we have been able to manufacture through indigenous knowledge and capabilities the most modern needed systems to defend our nation. People of the world, dear colleagues, Mr. Secretary General, it wasn't that our enemies took a step back. It was our nation that managed to drive all of her enemies from the arena by participating in an impressive and unprecedented fashion in the Islamic Revolution to solidify values of faith and divine will. In the second step, the policy of good neighborly relations. Progress in economic and trade relations have now been brought to the forefront of the Islamic Republic's foreign policy. We wish to have extensive relations with all nations throughout the world, particularly with our neighbors. neighbors. War is not the solution to crises. Dialogue and conversations and negotiations are the true solutions. The Islamic Republic of Iran as a powerful country in the region is present and willing to solve crises. During the past few years, the regional trade of Iran has seen impressive increases and we have now entered with our neighbors into a new season of expansion of friendly neighborly and brotherly ties 
This brings stability, this brings security to all sides. We proved uh, during the hard times of all of our neighboring countries that we are their true friends. During the numerous conversations that I've had with regional leaders, one of the main points was that the regional security must be born from within and not from the outside. And the way to realize that is collaboration and cooperation, not by forming opposing blocks. We must rely on brotherly and friendly relations. If we leave the fate and the destiny of the nations of the region in their own hands, then the occupiers will be gone and neighbors will remain for one another in eternity. In a not too distant past, we saw the fires of war between the two brotherly nations of Iraq and Iran by the encouragement of enemy powers throughout the world. But today we see the marches of Arba'in in observation of the 40th day of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. We see that that grand, glorious uh, march takes place in observance of that martyrdom and in order to renew our faith in those values and to respect those who gave their lives, the descendants of the Prophet who gave their lives for human dignity and human values. Uh, dear colleagues, I would like to direct your attention to one of the most egregious points that shows the oppressive powers present in the region. The region has not seen previously such a occupying savage power such as the Zionist regime in its midst in the past. The killing of children and women are present in the dark report card of the Zionist regime. It has managed to form the biggest prison in the world in Gaza. And the building of the expansion of settlements and housing on illegally on Palestinian territories and on Palestinian farms and the killing of their children and new generations shows everyone that seven decades of Israeli occupation and savagery is still with us and not ending. But the world powers must show why they keep running away and evading the solutions proposed by the Islamic Republic of Iran in order to resolve the Palestinian crisis. All of the Palestinian territory from mountains region to the sea requires only one solution which is the reliance on the votes of all Palestinians composed of Muslims, Christians and Jews in a completely comprehensive referendum. The occupying uh, Zionist power that has occupied Jerusalem and occupies other lands in the region cannot be a partner for security and stability. Dear colleagues, allow me uh, to focus your attention on another face of un lack of justice and fairness, which is the double standard used when speaking of the nuclear capacities, uh, nuclear science capacities of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And we all know that it's for only human and peaceful endeavors, but some countries are keen on portraying this as a threat in order to sweep under the rug what they should rightly face themselves, which should be denuclearization. And I announce as the leader of the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran is not seeking to build or obtain nuclear weapons. And such weapons have no place in our doctrine. This has been brought into the framework of a fatwa, of an official fatwa announced by His Eminence Supreme Leader Imam Khamenei and 
a Sharia-based fatwa issued by his eminence is more valuable than any measures with any outside or international agencies. And all of this is taking place in an environment where countries themselves who seek to show us unjustly as a threat keep pursuing nuclear weapons and development and testing and have made a gift of those weapons of mass destruction to the Zionist government. And those governments that must be disarmed are awarded. But those who are observing proper frameworks are even threatened by NPT measures. And in a framework where only 2% of the nuclear activities of the world are taking place in Iran, Iran has been the subject of 35% of nuclear inspections. I will repeat, only 2% of world nuclear activities are taking place in Iran, 35% of nuclear inspections are in Iran. So I ask all of those here present today to please focus on the next following points with precision. One, the Islamic Republic of Iran, with goodwill, signed an agreement, accepted an agreement in 2015, and in a first phase did live up to all of her commitments without any exceptions. But the result of that was the trampling upon by America on that agreement and as them, they sa themselves said in so many words, it, they were unprecedented measures, oppressive sanctions, measures in history, sanctions. Sanctions are an imposed punishment on the people of Iran for, their f for being freedom seekers. A weapon of mass destruction, that's what sanctions are. And abiding by those or cooperating in the implementation of those is helping oppression take root. It, two, it was America that trampled upon and left the agreement, not Iran. The International Atomic Energy Agency issued 15 different reports stating precisely that Iran had remained fully committed to all of her commitments. Number three, Iran, while simultaneously paid the price for having lived, lived up to her commitments, but as a result of the trampling upon by the United States and the cooperation of the European side by the United States has, man, has not been given the opportunity to obtain the rewards of such agreement, the rights of such agreement. We did give the ample opportunities for those who trampled upon and left this agreement to return to it. We have been extremely flexible and had it not been for our flexibility, the negotiations would have stopped in the very first few days. The logic of negotiations of Iran is a just analysis of what is going on. And our wish is only one thing, commitment, observance of commitments. Now, the issue of guarantees is not just for something that may happen. We're basing that on lived experience. We're speaking of the experience of America having left the JCPOA. And we have a year, year and a half of negotiations with the current American government to return, for her to return to the fulfillment of her commitments. And while today they speak of observing their commitments to this deal, they keep repeating the same old stories of the past, which puts a great deal of doubt on her true commitment to return to this agreement. Which brings us to another challenge. Can we truly trust without guarantees and assurances that they will this time live up to their commitment? Of course, the Islamic Republic of Iran with uh, various well-established and vast relationships with countries across the globe has managed to neutralize in many cases the sanctions and created new opportunities. According to the United States of America herself, as announced many times by many government officials, the maximum pressure policy has suffered an embarrassing defeat. We 
have found our path independent of any agreement and we will continue on that path steadfastly at the same time while we are very serious in the negotiations and we have shown and we have proven that if the rights of the people of Iran are respected there is a great and serious will to resolve all issues we believe that the knot of the nuclear deal must be open from the same place where they managed to tie this knot together friends esteemed representatives of nations the last part of my words with you is based on the need felt throughout the world for world justice and fairness. Every single one of us, every single human must be a part of building, actively building a new world based on justice, based on human values. If we wish the new world to be acceptable, to be one of character, to be one that is powerful and successful in resolving challenges facing humanity has no solution other than to be based on international fairness and justice, which needs the following principles. One, feeling collectively responsible throughout the world against oppression. Number two, respect for the wish and will of the people and nations and refraining from direct engagement in their internal affairs. Three, elimination of double standards. Four, standing up against violence and war. Five, independence and prudence in the actions of international organizations and most importantly, the creation of roles for dignified and qualified humans of experience so they can create this new system. Our viewpoint towards the horizon of the future is very realistic and we firmly believe that based on divine promises as delivered by the prophets, justice will become, will take over the world and those who are true followers of divine commands will be blessed by the reappearance of the last Messiah. I thank you all sincerely for your kind attention. May the blessings of the Omnipotent be on you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Islamic Republic of Iran for his statement, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency.